I encounter certain common objections or tropes. Um, things that either address to me or I see being um, promoted generally. One of these is that Marx means the same thing by communism and socialism. And that Marx was a socialist. And people say to me, why, if you wrote a book called Towards a New Socialism, can you be saying that Marx himself wasn't a socialist? Well, let's put my own excuses in first. The book Towards a New Socialism came out with the Bertrand Russell Press in 1993. It had been largely completed in 1990 in response to the crisis produced by Perestroika and we pan planned to publish it under the title Post-Soviet Communism. Verso had agreed to take it on but wanted additional changes. Um, they wanted additional chapters, for example, written critiquing Samuelson and took us a while to write these. Then the counter-revolutions in Hungary and the DDR occurred and Verso wrote to us saying that our book no longer fitted in with their commercial plans. We were then faced with repeated few refusals to publish the original text. The political environment was not suitable my brother suggested we contact Ken Coates, a Labour member of the European Parliament, who was on the board of the Burton Russell, Free, Burton Russell Press. And he agreed to publish it, subject to some editing to remove the technical chapters and make it more accessible and make it less overtly communist because of the fact that it was being published by a social democratic press. You've got to remember what the atmosphere was like in 1993. It was one of really strong right-wing triumphalism. It was held that communism had been permanently defeated, capitalism was the end of history, planning was nonsense and far inferior to the free market. Under the circumstances, we thought it would be better to promulgate Marxian communism under the label New, so New Socialism than not to be able to publish it at, at, at all. In fact, what we were putting forward was not, not something new, but something old. Hence, through, through the edited text, we talked about socialism rather than communism. But that was a concession to the environment. Now, Marx had more integrity than us. He was the leader of the Communist Party in Germany, and after the, the counter-revolution, the Communist Party was banned. And in 1849, he and its other leaders were forced to flee. And it wasn't for 20 years that a new workers' party was formed in German, Germany, Sozialdemokratische Arbeitspartei Deutschland. Um, and this was under socialist and not communist leadership. And even the socialists had to pretend to be just social democrats. <coughs> in contrast to, the, to this, Marx in 1847 had written Misère de la Philosophie as a polemic against the then leading socialist theorist, the French philosopher Proudhon. And in 1848, when he wrote Manifeste de Communistische Partei, it contains a lengthy polemic against the socialists. He's differentiating himself as a communist from the socialists. And if you read Capital, it's as much an extended polemic against Proudhonian and Rodbertian socialists as it is a work of economics. Um, Bordiga said of capital, it's not a work of economics, it's a, a, a communist manifesto. In 1875, he wrote as a private letter a long critique 
of the Lasallian socialist program adopted by the SDAP at the Gotha Partheitat. And this was later published and translated into various languages as the critique of the Gotha program. But it was a private critique of, of socialism that he wrote. Engels was a bit more flexible. He was hoping by deliberate terminological ambiguity to introduce communist ideas into the rapidly growing SDAP. He thus presented historical materialism as what he called scientific socialism. In a short book, Socialisme Utopique et Socialisme Scientifique, published in Paris in 1880 and again later translated into English. But Engels was still calling himself a communist, even if he was willing to publish things under the guise of socialism in 1888, well after Marx had died. Um, Engels wrote an introduction to the English version of the Communist Manifesto, which said, in 1847, socialism was a middle class movement, communism a working class movement. Socialism was, on the continent at least, respectable communism the very opposite and as our notion from the very beginning was that the emancipation of workers must be the act of the working class itself there could be no doubt as to which of the two names we must take moreover we have ever since been far from repudiating it in other words here he is towards the end of his life republishing the communist manifesto in English and saying I'm still a communist. So, the replacement of the 1848 German Communist Party by the 1869 German Social Democrats was a process of accommodation to the established order that's happened repeatedly. You see a transition from communism to socialism to social democracy, to liberalism. And this was repeated a century later with the dissolution of the KPD into the Socialist Unity Party in 1946 and the, the uh, Socialist Unipart Unity Party in response to the reactionary atmosphere of the 19, late 18, sorry, 1980s dissolved itself into the Party of Democratic Socialism, an explicitly Social Democratic Party. And even that is too left-wing. And now what we have in Germany is Die Linke, which says it's left doesn't even claim to be social democratic. Um, so that's a repeated process. You can see the same thing occurring in Britain, starting off further along the spectrum. You start off with the socialism of the UK Labour Party, um, which led to a split the, under the impact of the reactionary um, atmosphere of Thatcherism led to a split of the Labour Party to form a, a Social Democratic Party and the Social Democratic Party then moved further right and became the Liberal Democrats. So that is the, t the trajectory which repeatedly occurs. What was unusual about the Bolsheviks is they moved the other way. Uh, Lenin was the leader of the Russian Social Democrats until 1917 he openly called himself a Social Democrat or a socialist. In the crisis of 1917, he reread Marx's critique of social democracy and realised that a break with social democracy was necessary, and this is explained in his book, The State and Revolution. And the Bolshevik Party, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, renamed themselves communist in 1918. So that was a movement in the reverse direction. Lenin paid close attention to what Marx wrote in the Critique of the Gotha Programme. 
in particular to this passage. The question then arises, what transformation will the state undergo in communist society? In other words, what social functions will remain in existence that are analogous to present state functions? This is a question that can only be answered scientifically and one does not get a flea hop ho flea hop nearer to the problem by a thousandfold combinations of the word people and the word, word, word state. Between capitalist and communist society lies the period of revolutionary transformation. Corresponding to this is also a political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, note that Marx is talking about communist society here. He's not talking about socialism or socialist society. Mark Lenin also noted that Marx is talking about the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. And from then on, from, co from state and revolution on, Lenin decisively rejects any parliamentary road to communism. And this, this was actually the, the decisive factor in the break with social democracy, over the parliamentary road or not. Now, the Bolsheviks moved only part way towards Marx's critique of socialism in the, the Gother program. And there's some led them to some misunderstandings on this issue. Their, their previous socialist background led them to some misunderstandings on this issue. The first is whether Marx is talking about communism or, or socialism. Um, secondly, is it to be a non-labour income for, for capitalists? Thirdly, is payment going to be according to labour? Fourthly, is payment going to be in money? Now what Marx said here was we have to deal here with a communist society. Notice he's saying communist society, not socialist society. Not as it is developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, as it emerges from capitalist society, which is thus in every respect, economically, morally and intellectually, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges. Accordingly, the individual producer receives back from society after deductions have been made exactly what he gives to it. What is given is his individual quantum of labour, for example, the social working day consisting of the sum of individual hours of work. The individual labour time of the individual producer is part of the social working day and contributed by him, his share in it. He receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labour after deducting labour for the common funds and with this certificate he withdraws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labour cost. OK, so Marx is here being quite specific. He's talking about communism and he's talking about a system in which labour accounts are used. Now, how did the Bolsheviks match up with that? They thought that Marx was talking here about socialism. They thought that when Marx says communist society, they're talking about socialism being the first stage of communist society or stage before communist society. So they think Marx is talking about socialism. They agreed there should be no labour no non-labour income, but this was commonly agreed by all socialists. And yes, the, the Soviets claimed they had payment according to labour because there was non, no non-labour, non-labouring class receiving income. But the USSR retained money payment. Marx was explicit that he was talking about a non-monetary communist system. Now, does this mean that the Bolsheviks were betraying socialism? No, it doesn't. It means that the Bolsheviks were true to socialism because they were enacting what the socialists, as opposed to the communists, had always advocated. Let's take um, the, the issue of common ownership and eliminating 
income of capitalists and take a programme which everyone would agree is not communist, but just socialist. The programme of the British Labour Party adopted in 1918, which gave as its objective to secure for the workers by hand or brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution of thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry and service. Now that's what the USSR aimed to achieve. It can certainly be said the USSR was more successful at achieving it than the British Labour Party was. Why is this relevant? It's because the socialists still imagine this would be taking place using wa a wage economy. So we take another socialist authority, Kautsky, writing in the 1890s in his book The Class Struggle, which was enormously influential. And he says of socialism, all forms of modern wage payment, fixed salaries, peace wages, time wages, bonuses, all of them are reconcilable with the spirit of a socialist society. And there is not one of them that may not play, play a role in socialist society, as the wants and customs of its members together with the requirements of production may demand. So he's quite clearly assuming, and this he was the leading authority of the socialist movement, that socialism is a system based on monetary wages. And he's even more explicit in later writings. So um, in The Social Revolution, which came out just after 1900, he says here, I speak here of wages of labour. What, it will be said, will there be wages in the new society? Shall we not have abolished wage, labour and money? How then can one speak of wages and labour? These objections would be sound if the social revolution proposed to immediately abolish money. I maintain that would be impossible. Money is the simplest means known to the present time, which makes it possible in as complicated a mechanism as the modern productive process with its tremendous far-reaching division of labour to secure the circulation of products and their distribution to the individual members of society. It is the means which makes it possible for each one to satisfy his necessities according to his individual inclination to be sure within the bounds of his economic power. So, Kautsky, the Pope of Socialism, was quite explicit that the socialist economy, economy would retain money and retain monetary wages. And remember that on most things Lenin was a faithful follower of Kautsky and his objection to Kautsky was not that Kautsky had been wrong in the first place but that Kautsky was not consistent to his earlier um, proclamations. So we can contrast Marxist communism with second and third international socialism. They both agreed that you'd expropriate capitalists and landlords. They both agreed on common, common ownership. Marx, however, said there would be no commodities. The second and third international said you'd have money wages and products would still be sold as commodities. Marx said you would have no money, you'd have labour certificates. The second and third international said money would be return, retained. And Marx said there should be a direct tax on labour incomes, whereas the second and third international expected the profits from nationalised industries to support the state. Now, you may say, surely that wasn't what the third international said. Go and look at the conditions of adherence to the Communist International that were adopted at their Third Congress. Nowhere does it say that parties wishing to call themselves Communist parties and join the Third International must be opposed to money and commodities. Everything is focused on the need for organising revolution against the parliamentary state. 
key issue was the parliamentary versus the non-parliamentary road. So for Marx, socialism was a doctrine. What did it what did the word mean? It was a doctrine of his reformist rivals in the movement. And communism was the doctrine he advocated, and it was also a future state of society with common ownership and no money. For Lenin, socialism was the doctrine he himself supported, plus the society that would exist after the workers' revolution. And communism was a tendency within the workers' movement that stood for the revolutionary overthrow of the state and also meant a distant future society based on distribution according to need. Now, we can agree that Marx advocated ending commodity production. Would this involve the abolition of value? What would this mean? I hope to go into this in a subsequent talk. 